I hear some of you are new. Were you here? If you were here last year, clap. All right. So uh, hopefully it won't be, it'll be some new information for you. It's a pleasure to be here. Rachel Stone from my office was here yesterday. She did a breakout session. Uh, I'm a big fan of Brian. He's a success story here in Utah and love his vision for what government can be. It's great to hear from Becky and all the rollouts as well. So, I'm going to talk today, by the way, I am blind, this is not a fishing pole or a lightsaber, as some people confuse it. Literally, we were at Shields a couple years ago checking out for Christmas, and they wanted to charge me for this, uh, hands off. I'm like, this is not a fishing pole. So I'm going to talk today um, about a concept called the illusion of progress. And Title slide, I've got someone back there doing the slides. A blind person doing a PowerPoint. This could be a disaster. So if I'm speaking to a slide that doesn't exist, just work with me, okay? I'm gonna talk about this idea of the illusion of progress. And um, let me tell you a little bit about my history. So I start going blind when I'm 11 and went through so many different components of government bureaucracy. Uh, went on every type of case management plan you can imagine. Was on SSDI, really living not in a good place until I got and figured my life out. But I figured that I was on some form of government intervention or assistance for probably 12 years. And after 12 years, when I was in my early 20s, um, I, I had some mentors that came into my life and turned my life around. But I left with no skills after all that money government spent on me, and I'm grateful for the people that tried to help, but I didn't have any job skills, um, couldn't really travel independently, I couldn't use technology, and I was not equipped to be in the workplace. And so I think, my goodness, government spent time and energy and money on me, and I wasn't ready. But for the grace of God, I had some great mentors, like I said, came into my life. And why, why do I share this story with you? Because we in government have the opportunity to do really great things for people, uh, the taxpayers and the customers we serve, or we can waste a lot of time and money and resources and make a marginal impact or none at all. In my experience now in the governor's office of management and budget, I've worked for three governors. I now work for Governor Herbert and over the office of management budget, so the budget and operations for the state. And we see a lot of busyness, a lot of action, a lot of activities, a lot of change sometimes. And sometimes that change just gives us the illusion of progress rather than real progress. And I want to talk about this today because the stakes are so high, the work you're doing with asset management and making sure local governments work well, the stakes are so important that I, I want to talk about how do we distinguish between real progress and just the illusion of progress. Next slide. We want to start by stopping. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of things we could do. In every organization, there's a million opportunities to improve. I'm sure you could bring your team around and you could brainstorm and come up with a, lots of really interesting ideas. But the question is, of everything you could do, what should you do? In fact, the more I'm around great leaders, I've come to experience that great leaders are able to think clearly. It's not about how many initiatives they can launch. It's not how well they can speak. It's not how complex they can make their systems. It's about the clarity of thought, to bring clarity to complexity and simplicity out of chaos. And that requires very often that we stop doing things that are only giving us the illusion of progress. And great leaders over time can start to distinguish what to stop and what to start. Uh, go to the next slide. I love art, which is a funny thing being blind, but I love what art is trying to tell us and teach us. This should be the lithogram of Picasso. Is that true? Yes? I'm kind of getting like an echo in my speech thing. Do you guys hear the echo out there? It's kind of echoing in my headset. It's kind of driving me crazy. Anyway, Picasso drew these, um, this lithogram of bulls, and you can see his first iteration, the bull was very complex, right? And as he moves through, what do you notice about it? Is it getting more complex or less complex? 
less, right? He's stripping things out. He's getting to the essence of what's really, really important. And again, this is about as leaders learning to distinguish through all the noise, what's the real signal? Of all the data you could collect, what should you collect? Of all the changes you could make, what should you make? And it starts with, in some cases, what to strip away. There's a great quote, next slide, by Steve Jobs. If you know his story, he worked at Apple, they kicked him out. When he came back to work with Apple, they brought him back in. He said that one of the most important things he did was he went through a bunch of projects and X'd out tons of projects. No, 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 no. And you can go on and hear his quote. He said, you know, sometimes we think focus is focusing on what we think is important. He said, no, that's not true. It's learning to say no to the thousand good ideas that cross your desk. He's just as proud of what he said no to as to what he accomplished. How do we as leaders or in government, whatever your role is, how do we know what to say yes to and what to say no to so we can avoid the illusion of progress and make real progress? And having worked now in every type of work environment in government you can imagine, every kind of agency, we see these patterns that I'm going to talk about today. You can go to the next slide. These patterns are called what we call the seductive seven. These are solutions that are very easy for us to jump to, thinking that this is the answer. Now, the tricky thing about these as I go through these is that they're very often an important ingredient in our solution. It's like making lasagna. You have individual ingredients, but no individual ingredients is the recipe. You have to have the right recipe for the individual ingredients to work. And what we see time and time again in these patterns are people jumping to these solutions without understanding the problem they're trying to solve. In our experience that any change, we make a change because we have a problem. There's something we don't like, something we want to improve. We want to get better at something, and there's something blocking us, limiting us from achieving this new level of performance. And we've really got to start creating clarity on what's blocking us, what's the problem. Because if you, well, we'll go into this when I talk about strategy. We want to be very selective because change creates a lot of disruption in our organizations. Would you agree? It can burn out the front line, we can feel chaotic, we're bouncing back and forth, we sprinkle our time and energy everywhere. So we want to be selective about what, in fact, we focus on. So here, this deal. Now, again, let me reinforce, these aren't bad things. And some of these can be incredibly powerful tools. CityWorks is an incredibly powerful tool that can help you great get outcomes. But we want to think a little deeper about how do we use these tools. And again, what's the problem we're trying to solve? So here's the seductive seven. Uh, and I'll go through all of these in more detail, so don't worry. More money, more training and communication. I need more data. Data's not a bad thing. I love data, but we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of data we need and not need. Uh, we need more reorganization. Anybody been through a reorg before? And did that just solve the problems for you and you got a 50% improvement just through your reorg? Right? We'll talk about that. Sometimes we think the reorg will just solve our problems. Um, more technology, again, technology is incredibly powerful. As a blind person, I use technology to access your world every day, but we want to talk about how do we use it wisely. More strategy, and finally, more blaming and accountability. Uh, again, having been in this field for a long time now, these are patterns we see time and time again, from the federal government to local to state. So let me spend some time going through these. Let's go to the first one. Next slide. It says more money. Now, being the budget director for the governor, and we're in budget season right now, I get a little grumpy when people come and ask for more money. Because here's one truth. There will never be enough money to solve the problems in government. Would you agree? Never going to happen. We have one of the best performing economies in the country. We're number one in private sector job growth. We are nailing it in Utah. I'm very competitive with the other states. But regardless of how much money we have coming in, for every new dollar of revenue we have come in, we have four dollars of requests. You just can't fund everything. So if we think somehow more money is going to come in and solve all of our problems, you're going to be very, waiting for a very long time. But here's the challenge with more money. Next slide. This is a cartoon that I love. It has somebody with a bunch of ladders, yes? And they're using the ladders the wrong way. And basically, the tagline should say, if we don't know how to use our existing resources well, more of them won't help. 
And we can keep adding ladders and get incremental progress, but if you don't use the ladders the right way, more of them isn't gonna make a substantial gain in your performance. And I know this is a hard one for people to swallow. People for busy, stretched, we have challenges keeping up with demand or dealing with our resource inefficiency, our resource deficiencies. We've got maintenance issues. What do we do? The problem with more money, if you go to the next slide, with each of these, remember thinking is the biggest issue we need to bring to the table, right? Because if we think clearly, we'll make good decisions. If we make good decisions, we'll make right actions. If we make right actions, we'll get good results. But we first have to think clearly. And in all of these seductive seven, there's some kind of assumption we have that's driving our behaviors and choices. With more money, the illusion we have is that I'm using all of my resources as well as I can. They're optimized, I'm efficient, I'm as effective as I possibly can be with my existing resources. So the only answer is more of what I have. Now, if you've been in government as long as I have, I bet you would suspect that we're not always as efficient as we could be in government. Would you agree? Yes. And it's not even about cost cutting. It's about quality outcomes. We're not interested in costs. We're interested in the causes of cost, right? The costs are just a byproduct of how we're using our resources. Issues with quality, issues with rework, or issues with flow and workflow, um, with strategy. All of those create costs. And if we don't understand what's happening deep, deep in our systems, which you cannot see, it's very difficult to get a handle on your resources. And this is what shows challenging. So much of the work going on in our organization is invisible to us. We can't see it. We can't see really what's happening on the front line or what's happening with handoffs or what's happening with the case manager for, with the, from the person who just came out of the prison. What's that interaction like? So much of what happens is invisible and part of the job of a leader is to make the invisible visible because you can't really change stuff until you can see it and this is coming from a blind person so you better take that seriously, okay? So we here in this scenario what, never ever want to believe that we're as good as we can get, ever. We can always get better. We can always improve. We talk about hidden capacity. Let's go to the next quote. This is a quote by Jim Collins. If you know him, he wrote Good to Great. He has a great quote here, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you know, the reason why we don't have good, great government is because we have good government. The reason why we don't have great schools, we have good schools. The reason why we don't have great lives because it's so much easier to settle for a good life. Becoming great demanding more, believing that there's hidden capacity is a mindset. It is really easy just to accept the status quo and say we're as good as we can get. I think it takes visionary leadership to say no, just because I can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Go to the next slide. The mindset we need to have is that there's always hidden capacity. There's always more we can do to improve with the resources we have. And this is a mindset. This isn't about a tool or a technique. It's this belief. And I posted something about this a few days ago. And it's you know, just because I don't see an eagle or I don't see the trees anymore doesn't mean they don't exist. And the challenge about knowing, believing in hidden capacity, it's hidden. You can't see it right now. And it's about having the faith and the confidence that it's there and you just don't know how to find it yet. There's a great quote by Einstein I use all of the time. He says, he, you cannot solve problems at the same level of understanding you had when they were created. I love that, meaning we can't keep thinking the way we're thinking right now to get a new level of performance, to find the hidden capacity, to get more out of the resources we have, to get better outcomes of the people we serve with our existing resources, means we can't keep thinking the same way we've been thinking. And this is a whole mindset issue we, we teach here in Utah, but it's learning to see what you can't see right now. And there's some kind of humility that has to play into this, because to say, I want to be here, and I'm here today, and I want to be here, and I don't know how to get there right now. That takes some confidence and some faith that you can get there. And I see so many of our organizations, from higher education to our healthcare systems, and we see you know, costs going up and up in our country in some of these spaces, and people are sometimes like, but we're as good as we can get. We're really busy. The answer is more money. But what if we just dared to believe it's there, 
we just have to figure out how to find it and to learn skills and ways to see that we've never seen before. I'm gonna tell this story here and I apologize for those of you here last year. Do you mind if I tell a story I told last year? Are you good with this? Well, you're gonna hear it even if you're not okay. So, but 50% of you are new, but it's an important lesson here. Um, I spoke to it last year. I tell the story a lot, but I use it every day of my life um, when I'm just navigating the world. And it's so true here. When I was going blind, um, just had a few years of I was in this transition world and wasn't fully using a cane at the time. My vision was much better than it is today. Today I'm pretty much fully blind. Fell in a manhole. Had, it was a big wake up call. So I ended up going to a residential training program for about four or five months where we would wear sleep shades. So we'd have to really learn how to immerse ourselves in the skills and the language of blindness. And there's lots of things we'd have to do. We'd have to learn how to use part power saws or power saws and build furniture and barbecue and yada yada. But one of the things we'd have to do to graduate is they would put us in a van with our sleep shades on and music playing so we couldn't understand or hear where we were. And they would drive us around. We were in Baltimore, Maryland at the time. Drive us around the city, drop us off at a random location, and we'd have to get back to where we started by ourselves. And we could ask one question along the way and we could use a braille compass. And it was, that was of all the things that I had to practice for for graduation, that to me seemed like the scariest, hardest thing to overcome. So every day we would practice what we call orientation and mobility, which is cane travel. And I had this awesome teacher, Tony Cobb, and he was hard on me in a great way. He had high expectations. Um, he'd give me enough rope to kind of struggle and hang myself with. We were at a park one day and he'd always stand back and let me just struggle through it. And I. Could, I could still remember where I was. I could hear the highway, it was to my right. So I knew where I was, north, south, east, west, but I could not get myself out of this park. I would walk, I'd hit a bench. I'd walk, I'd hit dirt. I'd walk, I'd hit grass. It was like the Minneapolis airport, just whines and makes no sense. <laughs> That's how I experienced the Minneapolis airport. Really hard place to navigate. And finally, I just stopped. I just stopped. And I think sometimes, we can do this in our organizations um, or just in our personal lives, right? We can become a little cynical. We can become a little jaded. We can get tired. We can say this is good enough. We can assume where we are is sufficient. We settle for mediocrity. What he came up and told me, because he could tell I was stubborn and I was not going to move, he let me struggle for a little bit. And then he came up and he told me something that uh, affects how I do my job. He says, Kristen, you have to learn to walk through your uncertainty, through your fear, and through your confusion. So there is no new information by standing still. You have to take a step into the unknown to get the new information. That was so life-changing for me because sometimes I was just waiting for life to come to me. And as a blind person, you have to go walk into the room and hit the table to know that the table's there. And it's not always comfortable or fun but it's what it takes to get from point A to point B. And sometimes we want certainty. We want to have it planned out. That's when I see people say, yeah, I'm going to get a 2% improvement. That only means that they're forecasting out what they already know how to do. That's not where real change happens. Real change is when we want a 25, a 50, 100% improvement, and we expose the gap. We expose where we are and where we want to be and it forces us to see that we can't get there today doing what we're doing, and we have to take a walk and a step into the unknown. And there's this space of feeling comfortable with being uncomfortable. And we don't like that. We want to always know what we're doing and how we're going to do it, and I think it's essential for us to get breakthrough results is to walk in that space of I'm not sure. And sometimes as leaders, we think we have to know it all and have it figured out. And I just, I don't think that's realistic if you want to get great improvements. You think some of the biggest scientific breakthroughs we've had from Einstein on, it was people who didn't know, but were insatiably curious to figure out something new. They had a hypothesis, they couldn't see it, but they kept walking through till they found the answer. So this idea that we need more money and that we're as good as we can get is nonsense. The right mindset we need to have is that there's hidden capacity and we just have to learn to think differently, to see different patterns, and to figure out how to get more with the resources that we have. All right, that's deductive seven number one. The second one 
next slide, should say more training. Yes? Yes, okay. More training and communication. Again, is training a bad thing? No, but it's not sufficient. Let me tell you why. You can go to the next slide. This is a picture of a garbage can, yes? So back in the day, you would see fast food restaurants. You know, you, you go get your food, and it was a rectangular tray, and when you were done, you'd you know, go throw your stuff away in the garbage can. Well, a lot of times people weren't thinking clearly, and they take their tray and throw the whole tray into the garbage can. And so the fast food restaurants kept trying to train people, put signs up, hey, please don't throw away your, your tray. And they found that that wasn't sufficient. So what they ended up doing in many cases, they would make the top of the garbage can round so that the rectangular tray couldn't fit. They made it impossible for people to throw it away. So, so why do I share that? Next slide. The illusion, the mindset we have when we run into training is that the problem is a lack of information. If I just gave people more information, that that would be sufficient. How many of you in this room know that sugar is not good for you? And how many of you keep eating sugar? Me too. My Coca-Cola, that's my vice in life, right? Fully loaded Coca-Cola. Lack of information is usually not the problem. In Utah, for example, we have one of the driest states in the country, second driest, depending on some data that you look at, very dry state, and yet we have people using a lot of water in Utah. And so we can do a big public awareness campaign and tell people, hey, conserve water, be cautious how you use water. And that feels good and it's nice. But let me give you this little fact. In Utah, we highly sub subsidize water. Water is not paid through fully through user fees and water rates. It's paid through, through property tax subsidies and sales tax subsidies. So if I'm a water user and water is really cheap and I see an ad about use less water, how likely is it do you think that I'm going to use less water? Not very likely. What the problem is is when we believe that lack of information is the problem, what are we missing? Why do I care about that? What I'm more interested in, you can go to the next slide that should say the right mindset, is I want to understand how to design a process or the incentives or the policy to make it natural and easy for people to behave the way I want them to behave. And then of course I can use training to reinforce that, right? Like with the garbage can example, how do I build it into the process or into the policy or into the way I actually price something so that people just do what I hope that they're gonna do? The minute I'm trying to train people into behaving the way I want them to behave, I'm, I'm losing. Because there's such inertia in the current makeup of the system that I'm trying to use training to overcome how the system is designed. That's crazy business. We first have to design the system so that the inertia and the momentum of the system gets people to where we want them to be. And then we can use training to augment and to reinforce and to clarify, and it can be powerful then. For example, federal government just passed something back in DC about child welfare reform. Um, it's called a family first model. So they want child welfare workers to work with the full family, not just the kid. First of all, is this a new idea? No. Social workers on the ground will be telling you this is what they wanted to do for years. But if I have this great new idea, and I come back and I try to train my front line about family first, but I change nothing in the operations, how they manage their work, the amount of work they get, how they follow up, the time they have to complete work before a new case comes in, what's the likelihood that they're gonna spend more time with families? It's not gonna happen. You can train them all you want, but if the inertia of the system is pulling them in another direction, good luck. It's like the tide in the ocean. Our systems have an enormous momentum. We need to figure out where the momentum is driving people and let that be the natural way we get people to do what we want them to do and then use training to supplement. So whenever I see the training is the big solution without looking at the policy, the operations, I'm always a little cautious. The next one is more data. Yes? If I get all these slides right, I give myself a treat, so I'm very, I gotta, get, I gotta nail this today, it's Friday, plus I wanna eat whatever I want on Fridays. So, more data. Now, 
data is great. City works as this powerful platform, right, where you guys can access data. So why am I saying data is one of the seductive seven? Let me give you some facts. Arches National Park, that should be the next slide. Here's some facts about Arches National Park. About 2,000 arches, over 120 square miles, highest elevation is over 5,600 feet, lowest elevation around 4,000 or so. So many different species of plant life, et cetera. I can give you lots of data points about arches, right? Because data are words and numbers. Next slide. There should be pictures of arches. Did that data really describe arches to you? There is a difference between data and insight. There is a difference between data and true understanding. And data can be incredibly powerful if used the right way, or it can drown you in noise. Another story when I was going through this um, training, I, uh, when we would practice cane travel, one day they took us into the inner harbor of Baltimore City. Anyone been to the inner harbor? There's this crazy intersection there where you have to, there's like six streets merging. You have to cross, get to an island, cross again, kind of at an angle. It's a crazy place. And we were there at this cross place. And you know when they, um, maybe some of you in the room have done this, where you have those chirping birds for blind people, those chirping things on the street lights, that you know what I'm talking about? I gotta tell you the secret as a blind person, I have no idea what those mean. <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to go north or south or east or west and cities, you know, I have no idea. And that's kind of the, the truth about most of us blind people. We listen to traffic flow, not those things. Anyway, so I'm at this intersection and because there's so many streets merging, I got all these chirping things going off everywhere. And it's super confusing to me. I'm getting so much noise I can't treat here through all the noise the true signal. So finally I just had to figure out how to tune that out so I could hear the traffic flow so I knew when to cross safely. Why do I share that with you? Next slide. The illusion we have, this, this, this flawed assumption we have with more data is that the more data I have, the more understanding I have, the more I can uncover reality. The truth is our data are words and numbers. They can be, again, very powerful if we know what questions to ask. Data can't overcome poor thinking. Data is there to help us answer questions. The biggest breakthroughs we've had in society weren't because we did a data mining dump. It's because people had an hypothesis. They are curious. They ask great questions. Rachel Stone gave me this quote. She's in the audience, and it's from Einstein again. And basically, he said, give me a problem, a world problem I need to solve in an hour, I'll spend 55 minutes trying to figure out the right questions to ask and five minutes answering them. Let me show you some interesting dashboards. Next slide. This is from the federal government. I love picking on the federal government, right? Who doesn't? <laughs> um, this is a dashboard from the Department of Education. Just traditional dashboard. This is how a lot of education stuff will look at. You'll say number of people graduating from high school, number of people who have a post-secondary degree, number of kids who are proficient in reading at fourth grade based off the NAEP score. It's a standardized national score. Number of kids in eighth grade that are proficient in reading, math, science, based off the NAEP scores. We have all this data. But does that give you any insight? Does that tell you what to do? Does it tell you why people are getting better or worse? A lot of our data is just point in time information. And it's interesting. We call it descriptive data. It can kind of describe to us a point in time snapshot of what's happening. But that's different from insight. Insight's the traffic flow. Now that I can hear the traffic flow, I know what to do differently. Right, here's another example of federal government. Next slide, this is IT projects, how much we've spent on IT projects, the number of IT projects that are on schedule and on budget, number of IT projects that are important and a priority. Interesting. Is there any insight there? Do we have any idea what impact the IT has had on the business? Any idea if projects are late, why, and what do we do about that? Now again, I'm not saying these aren't informative and can tell you a little bit about more questions you want to answer. But I see organizations setting up 
massive data lakes and databases with lots of dashboards and yet no insight. And we could spend an hour just talking about data, how to use it well, and how to get the signal versus the noise. A hint, beyond measuring the outcomes and what other people are doing, you better be measuring yourself and understanding the impact you're having on the outcome you want. It's, those are process measures we won't talk about it today. But data can be so powerful, but it hinges on our ability to think. And what are the key questions we need to answer. So let's go to the next slide. I told you the mindset, the, poor, the illusion is that more data will give us more understanding. The right mindset we want to have, are, what are the questions I need to answer? I'm paraphrasing all this stuff, right? What are the questions we need to really answer so that I can get true insight? Next slide. This is a picture of the criminal court JJ, or CCJJ, yes? It has like five boxes. Yes, verbal feedback. Do not be nodding your heads. It's not going to help me. All right, so this is an example. Um, we had a project here a couple years ago. The legislature appropriated some money to build a data warehouse for our, uh, basically our criminal justice system. And there was a lot of effort putting into building up some databases and servers and really good people, right? The IT people were doing, they were asked us to put the equipment together. That's really interesting. And you, you could build all this data and put all this data together and start tracking all of these elements, and this is a very high level description of what happens in this system. There's an arresting decision. Somebody gets arrested and there's a decision, do they go into bail or detention? And then there's a sentencing decision by the judge. Does this person get released or on probation? Um, and, or, or are they going into the prison? You know, what's their penalty? And then from there, there's a decision, you know, they re-enter society, there's an assessment, how do we help these people re-enter successfully, and then um, behavior modification. There's a lot that goes into this. I know this is oversimplified, but that's essentially it. So there's a lot of different data you could track everywhere here, right? But using your intuition, what decision here is going to have the biggest impact on somebody's life? If I'm at the judge and I either sentence somebody to the prison system, which can cost the state almost 37,000 a year and basically put a black mark on this person forever and put them into a prison system, which is incredibly difficult, or release them into the community. Of all the things I need to focus on, that decision will have the most impact on the taxpayer, the individual, and the victim. So we can go collect a lot of data and build big data lakes but again, what are the questions I'm trying to answer? In this case, if I'm the judge, what information does the judge need? When does the judge need it? So that the judge can make the most informed, exp expedited decision possible. In some cases, the judge is waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks to get the information while the person's just rotting in jail, waiting for a decision. Again, we can get lost in data here. In fact, when we started, they started collecting this, and you know, you can collect data, illusion of progress. Oh, I set up a database. Illusion of progress, great. You were successful in making a change. Who cares? Is recidivism rates down? Are we quicker at making judicious decisions for the people who are um, accused of a crime? Those are the things we need to see. Do, does our data produce tangible for results for the taxpayers and the customers? In fact, when we, we sat down with some people, we ended up kind of taking this project over, and we sat with some people at the beginning, and the police officers were like, when I'm about to take arrest somebody, I have no time to sit there and pull up a data thing on my iPad to do a review. I mean, there's some common sense that has to go into this. So this is an example of where data, again, can be incredibly powerful if we know how to focus it and what are the questions we're trying to answer. All right, more data by itself is not gonna solve it. In fact, you could just get confused and create a lot of noise and chaos in your system. Um, next slide. Is this the mindset? No, this is the last of it, right? More reorganization, thank you. You can be my eyes on this, my friend. Um, I give myself two errors, so I still get my treat. That counted as one, so I still, right? I get a little flexibility. So um, more reorganization. I mean, this one's pretty straightforward. You can go to the mindset. We tend to believe if I have authority over the resources that the system will improve, right? 
And I'm not saying reorgs aren't a good thing. I've had to do them before, and there's sometimes they create a synergy. But again, we're trying to go back to what's the problem I'm trying to solve? What questions am I trying to answer? What's the problem? What's the limitation? What's blocking me? And how does reorganization help me with this? It's interesting, in our legislature, about 12 years ago or so, there is a system of higher education and a system of technical colleges. And they put them together and reorganize them to be one thing. What do you think they're doing this year? Separating them back out. Have you ever seen that happen? We centralize, we decentralize. We move programs from here to here. Um, you know, there's a whole new mantra in society now. What's well, not even new? It's a new word for something that's been going on forever. Social determinants of care wraparound service, a system of care. That is, if I have somebody who's a vulnerable population, how do I bring all of these resources together to help this person who has complex and diverse needs? I can reorganize all I want, but this idea, some have said, well, let's create an agency where all of the services that person needs is right there. Let me ask you this. Are you ever going to have a government entity that owns all of the resources? the government agency of everything from housing to transportation to food stamps to Medicaid to SNAP to refugee relocation to employment. It's never going to happen. Health care, physical health, mental health, never going to happen. And even if you did, within the agencies, you'd have divisions. You'd still have silos within the, the new reorganized entity. Moving the problem around does not solve the problem. There is a difference between coordination and co-location. Those are separate things. We have to understand that what's really solving, what's really blocking us is an issue of synchronization, and we're not going to talk today about how to solve that. But moving the problem around isn't going to have it. What we want to have is the next slide, please. The mindset we want to have is that I can get a win-win for all the stakeholders within the existing organization. Because you know what that has, makes me do? That makes me think. I don't just get to move an org box. I got to figure out why can't I sync up what I'm doing with this person over here? Because a lot of these seductive seven are tricky because they're what we do at the administrative level. They're things we can touch feel at the administrative level, but they seldom impact the front line where all of the value is created. It's created on the front line, not with people like me. So how is it that the front line can't sync up and coordinate and focus on the person at the right time and provide the right amount of services at the right time and the right amount? What's blocking that? It's not an admin change up here. It's not reorganizing funding. It's not reorgan. Those things can maybe help and create synergy. I'm not saying they couldn't be part of the solution, but by themselves, they'll never, ever, ever solve the problem, OK? So reorgs be a little cautious. Could be helpful if, again, we understand the limitation that we're really trying to remove. So that's a, um, more reorganization. The next one we have here is more technology. CityWorks is a technology platform. I use technology every day. I have a Braille note that I use that you know, allows me as a blind person to take notes and stuff. I use technology all the time. Is technology a bad thing? Next slide. This is a, should be a funny picture of a guy weightlifting, yes? What do you see in that? What does that make you think of? There's a, simpler an there's a simple answer, and then there's a complex answer, yes? <laughs> Sometimes in our society, we are allured by and attracted by sophistication and complexity. I think complex is just another word for I don't know. <laughs> it's very complicated. Well, really, that means you just don't understand it. Somehow, we think the more sophisticated it is and the more complex, the better it is. But when you look really at some of the best thinkers in the world, they brought simple, clear answers to the table. And actually, simple is much harder. There was a quote one time, and it was a famous, I think it was Mark Twain. He said, I apologize for writing a five-page letter. I didn't have time to write a one-page letter, right? It's much more difficult to write a tight, succinct one-page letter than just ramble on for five. Simple is hard. Leonardo da Vinci once said, simplicity is the new sophistication. To get to the simple root essence, like in Picasso, to strip away, to get the essence of something is so difficult. And technology is amazing and powerful and has changed our lives for the good. And yet, it, become, it can introduce complexity into our systems. 
Because we can do something now with technology, we do. Because we can hold a lot of data, which can be very insightful, sometimes we collect more data than we need and we become blind through all the data. So the challenge with technology, next slide, is that we think we need a new tool or capability. And again, sometimes we do. I heard Becky's discussions of what's really now, and there's exciting stuff here, right? So I'm not against it. What I am saying, though, is back in the days before we had technology, if you needed a hammer, you knew exactly why you needed a hammer, right? Screwdriver. You understood the problem you're trying to solve. I was um, working with a group about a year ago, and they had purchased a $200 million piece of technology. This group did eligibility for Medicaid, what's called SNAP is now the old, you know, new food stamps, a lot of type of public assistance programs. And this um, program would run the eligibility, look at household composition, um, income, uh, how, you know, assets to see if somebody qualified for these programs. And the, and the technology, $200 million, promised the following. People were working out of five different systems, so, so there's a lot of redundancy in the system. The system had a rules-based technology, meaning they could put the data in, and the system would calculate the income and everything and run the rules to say this person is eligible or not. And um, you know, some, some really cool features on that. So rules-based, cutting edge technology, and it would integrate these five sis separate systems into one system. That sounds great, doesn't it? Would you purchase it? Again, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What are the questions you need to ask? In this specific example, let me give you some data that may help you. The processing time, if I'm a worker and I have all the information I need to make a decision, that's going to take me 30 minutes on average. If it's a more complicated case, maybe 40 minutes. But I have everything I need, all the verifications from the customer, 30 to 40 minutes to process the case. But you know how long cases were taking to get processed? 30 days or more. And that's pretty common across the United States. Somebody will make an application, 30 days. 45 days later, the application comes out. 30 minutes of processing time, 30 days of what we call elapsed time. Do you see the problem? The new technology, what was it fixing? The elapsed time or the processing time? The processing time, 30 minutes. So now I'm a worker, rather than having to work in five different systems, I work in one. That saves me two minutes. The system runs the rules. Maybe that saves me another five minutes. So now I've got my processing time from 30 minutes maybe to 20 minutes. But what about all of the other time, the application's just sitting in the system? What's going on there? That's where we talk about making the invisible visible. Why is it stuck? Why is it churning and churning and people are touching it multiple times? What's going on there? Those are the questions we have to learn to start thinking about because no amount of technology can fix that. It's a tool and it can be a powerful tool if we know how to focus it and how to use it to remove a limitation. And if you figure that out, you're unstoppable because then technology can automate good thinking or it can automate dysfunction and accelerate your errors, all right? So again, the mindset is we just need a new tool. The right mindset we need to have is we first need to understand the business problem, the limitation that's blocking us. And then we can use technology to amplify and really solve that problem. We now do this, or starting this with our new Department of Technology Services, we call it a full engagement model, where we have a process to think through all of this before we automate. And then we can automate and get really, really good results. Because at the end of the day, we need to show that our investments, more money, results in a really powerful outcome for the people we serve. And it's tangible and it's measurable, that we just don't purchase something or spend a lot of money and it disappears into the ether of government but we can actually show with our heads raised high to your city councils, to your bosses, to your legislators, to the customers, this was my investment and guess what? You're 22% better because of it. We have a way to measure all that, but we're, we're pretty insistent on it. So that's technology. Uh, let's go to the next one. More strategy. I'm almost done, just two more. Next slide, should show a picture of Mars, yes? Okay, so NASA 
our United States government has a goal to go to Mars by 2030. It's an awesome goal, right? Very ambitious. We love ambitious goals. We love ambitious targets because it exposes our gaps and shows us everything we need to do differently to get to a new level of performance. We want to go to Mars by 2030. That's a great idea. But where are all the problems going to show up in execution? How do I actually build a, a rocket that can get there and back? How do I protect the astronauts from the havoc space can put on a human body with radiation and the lack of gravity? How do I get, provide food and water for somebody there long enough? I mean, there are so many issues in, ox, in execution, all the obstacles in execution. Think of Amazon. The idea, one place to shop, simple. Where are all that problems? In execution. How do I create a good supply chain? How do I create vendor agreements so that it's a fair, you know, fair split between us and the vendor? How do I have inventory so I don't have stockouts? How do I deliver this whole one time and create a network of delivery so that people get the product when I promised? The problems are in execution. I see organizations sometimes flip from new strategy to new strategy to new strategy or they have the same strategy every year, which tells you something. What does that tell you? I'm going from a new idea to a new idea to a new idea, or I keep having the same idea. It's telling me I have still, well, let me go to the thing. The, the mindset we have, the illusion we have is that I need a new idea. If I just had a new idea, my problem would be solved. I hate to tell you, there's not a lot of new ideas out there. There are a few. The magic, the leadership happens in excellent, stellar execution. That's where most of the obstacles are. Having good strategy is critical because think of this, strategy is just the direction of the solution. That's all it is. It's the direction of the solution. If I have a direction of a solution, I better first have a problem that I've defined so I know what I'm trying to solve. But it's just the direction. It's like I'm going to go east for a vacation. I got to figure out exactly where my hotel, how much I can spend. Am I going to travel by car, by plane? What, how much money I can spend on the hotel? What sites am I going to see? It's an execution. In execution, there's so much opportunity. Earlier about money, your money, your people, your flow, your obstacles are in execution. It's very easy. Once we launch a new, the new idea is fun. That's the fun thing, to come up with a strategic plan and a new idea. What is really hard, the grind, is in the day-to-day -day execution and having the courage to break every obstacle that comes your way. And our mind, government is made up. It's all made up. And if it's not producing what we want, we need to think differently about how to remove those obstacles. The conflicts in our organizations exist because of poor thinking. It's not like gravitational pull or cork theory that's a law of science we can't move. We can bend our systems to produce what we want them to produce if we dare to think differently about them in the execution. And this is boring, grindy stuff. We're doing a big project across the state right now to truly synchronize social service programs across all of our agencies. It is hard and it is a grind and you come up with obstacles day in and day out, but that's where the magic happens. So very cautious of organizations. Strategy is incredibly important to make sure we're going in the right direction and that we've really solved the problem but really where the opportunity is in execution. And I often find in government, we're normally steeped and very well trained in policy and in analysis and statistical analysis, very, very critical. But operations, when I've studied, we had, I had somebody on my team go survey a bunch of MPP and MPA programs, really stellar stuff. I'm not against them. I've got some you know, great people on my team who have them. But the, this issue of flow and workflow and all this stuff, it just, it's not focused on in government, and it's, I think, lacking. And I think there's such opportunity for people to find uh, a lot of capacity there. So final one on this. Uh, blaming and accountability. You can go to the next slide. It showed show a picture of a jar. There's a fable of a boy, and he put his hand in a jar that was filled with candy, and he couldn't get his hand out, and he kept waiting for somebody to help him get his hand out. And his parent came to him and said, all you got to do is let go of the candy. But he didn't want to let go of the candy. And he wanted somebody else to solve this problem for him. 
why do I share this? I was with an organization probably a couple years ago and talking to the management team, and they said that 30 to 40% of their employees were poor performers, so they were putting them on PIPs, performance improvement plans. 30 to 40%? Really? Interesting, that seems a little high to me, because in my mind, most people are good. We do have some, you know, bad apples once in a while, but I think most people show up to work, they care, they want to do a good job. If they're not producing, we want them to produce, really blaming is the first place we go to. Why do we do that? It's easy. We found out when we sat down with this team and really looked at how they had set up their entire system from the beginning to the end, how they were managing performance, how they were measuring performance, how things that were blocking the people from being successful they weren't aware of, didn't understand, and they had not removed those limitations for their people. When we finally got their system under control, what amazing thing happened? The people all of a sudden started to perform better. It's easy, it was so easy for the management team to blame. It's easy for me to blame the federal government, the legislature. You can blame your supervisor, your boss, your partner, your colleague. And we can abdicate our power to make an impact to everybody else. Next slide. The illusion, the bad mindset is that somebody else hinders my ability to make an impact. My boss, my supervisor, the legislature, I don't have enough funding, my city council, my city planner, blah, blah, blah. Somebody else is blocking me from making progress. Why is that a problem? Why is this mindset a problem? I have all of the things. I have seven seductive seven. This is one of them. Why? Because as soon as I start blaming somebody else, a few things happen. Number one, I don't look at the process or the policies or incentives that may be prohibiting them from doing a good job. It's lazy thinking, it's superficial. But I think almost more important is I abdicate my power to make a difference in my life. I'm waiting for somebody else to solve my problem. And that's not a great place to be. When I was going through this training, I had this amazing mentor, Dr. Kenneth Jernigan. He was completely blind. He was one of the smartest people I met. He had incredibly high expectations for blind people, and he was hard on me, and in good ways. Like, he, he changed my life through that. And he, he said one thing. He said, Kristen, what do you think the biggest problem with blindness is? And this was many, many years ago, and it's really easy you know, you could say, well, lack of vision, lack of technology, lack of access, employers won't give me a job, da 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 And I can blame the world, I can blame technology, I can blame a lot of stuff. But he said, Kristen, the real problem with blindness, and this is why defining the real problem is so important. This is the real problem with blindness is the poor stereotypes and perceptions people have of blindness. But he said, Kristen, equally important, it's the stereotypes you have about yourself. So if you can't change those in yourself, you're not going to change them in anyone else. And that was the hardest work, to beat them out of myself, right? And I still come up those against the other day. We bought one of those Instapots. Do any of you guys have an Instapot? Those, I am scared to death of those things. I think that thing is going to like blow up on me. And I remember when we first got it, I literally thought to myself, well, I'm blind, I can't do this. And I had to remember the words of Dr. Jernigan, challenge my own thinking. You know, because you have to, there's this button you have, it's a pressure cooker, and there's this button you have to push to let the pressure out, and I didn't know how to find the button and release the pressure without getting my hand burned. It ended up being a super, very simple solution. I just used a wooden spoon to find it and push it, and the steam came out. But at first, I, I caught myself, even then, in such a simple thing, kind of blaming the Instapot, blaming my environment, and it's such a horrible way to live. The right mindset we want to have is I want to perfect what's under my stewardship and control. Each of you in this room, me, we each already have work to do. We can start looking at everybody else and blaming them and criticizing them and telling them why they're not doing a good job, but we lose our focus. And when we reshift the focus back to us, what do I have stewardship over? What am I responsible for? Which is my own actions, my own thinking, my own attitude, my own work product, my own delivery, my own outcomes. When I have perfected that, when I have my own house in order, then and only then do I have the right 
to start pointing fingers. And even then, I'm very hesitant about pointing fingers because usually people are just stuck in poorly designed systems and they themselves are working in a system that poorly incentivizes the wrong behavior. I think the journey of improving our organizations is highly connected to the journey of improving ourselves. You can't disconnect the mindset. You can't show up to work and be a victim at work and not be a victim at home. You can't show up at work and expect great results and think bigger and not be willing to compromise and then be home at home be different. The heart, the mind, the expectations we bring in our home life and our personal lives is what we bring to the workplace. And that's the exciting thing. It's, it's that if we start to, to basically embrace these principles, finding the core problem, having high expectations, not placing blame, thinking clearly, never settling, always believing we can break conflicts, it affects our personal lives. And we can have a much more rewarding life both personally and professionally. So this blame thing is just almost the foundation of all of it because the minute I start looking outside for somebody to solve my problems, I'm giving control of my destiny to somebody else. I never want to be in that position. We have to learn to be stewards of our own minds, hearts, and bodies, and the work we do in our work products. And I've seen this when leaders, we have organizations, Rachel can attest this, we have some agencies who are just, the leaders have starting to do such great, great work that their credibility is awesome. So when they come and they actually have a budget request, they've just expanded their circle of, of influence because they started improving what they already owned before asking for, for help and pointing to something else. Um, I want to go to the next slide and then I'm going to wrap up. Here's, here's the fundamental problem. These seductive seven are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're easy to jump to. It's easy to think these things will solve our problem, right? More money, more training, more data, more reorganization, more technology, more strategy, more blaming and accountability. Now again, a lot of these, except for blaming, the first six, are really important. You have a platform here that can be transformative. And what I was talking to Brian, those guys back out, out in the back about, is that your ability to customize and make it work for your unique environment. And that's about your ability to think. Its potential is in your hands. And what happens when we don't understand the core problem, we get distracted with all these things that give us the illusion of progress because we're busy and doing cool stuff is that we feel we have these problems in our organization. We feel pressure to introduce a change. So we introduce a change without start understanding the core problem. And so we've introduced more initiatives into our organization. So our time and attention is sprinkled. We've introduced complexity into our systems. We still don't have the outcomes we want. The problems still persist. And so we have pressure to more introduce more initiatives. And the cycle goes on and on and on. In the meantime, frontline are burned out. Taxpayers are frustrated. City councils and legislators are wondering, where are you spending all your money? You don't have a great compelling story to tell. And the question is, what is the story you're going to tell? Is it this? Or is it going to your constituents and saying, you gave us this much money. And because of this, we're 20% faster. Our outcomes are 50% better. And our costs are down by 10%. What's the story you're going to tell? And you know what? That's in your control. None of these will solve that for you. You can have the tools, the platforms, all of that, but it boils down to your ability to think clearly. I'm going to end with one more story and give you a couple stuff. When um, one of my other mentors, Dr. Fred Schroeder, just awesome, awesome guy, and he was again like Dr. Jernigan. I had three in my life, Mr. Gashel, Dr. Schroeder, and Dr. Um, Jernigan, and they were both really hard on me. <laughs> and Dr. Schroeder told me a story one day. He was um, working with a little boy named Tony, and Tony was seven, and Tony was blind. And Dr. Schroeder at the time was an itinerant teacher, meaning he would go work in the mainstream schools with blind kids to help them integrate into school. He was working with this little boy named Tony, and Tony wanted to play tag, which is very common for a little kid, right? We have two boys. Boys love to play tag. I love to play tag. He wanted to play tag. So Tony said to Dr. Schroeder, hey, Dr. Schroeder, how do I play tag? Dr. Schroeder said, let me go home and think about it. And Dr. Schroeder now really has super high expectations for blind people. He's like, there's nothing the blind person can't do. But he went home that night, and he came to the very sad conclusion that Tony was going to have to sit this one out. 
This is one thing that Tony wouldn't be able to do. And he was super disappointed about it, but he said, you know, Tony can do most things, but you know, he'll have to deal with this one. So he goes back to the school the next day to tell Tony, and but for the grace of God, right, Tony spoke before Dr. Schroeder could say anything because kids have not learned all the weirdness we learned as adults, right? What's possible, what's not possible. You know, they just think it's all possible. So Tony goes up to Dr. Schroeder and goes, I figured it out, I know how to play tag. He got in jars and he had put rocks in these different jars and he'd given the jars to his friends and they agreed that they would, you know, stay in a certain area and then he could just hear his friends play tag. I actually tested this with our family. I made them all wear their phones and play music on their phones so I could hear them and they all wore sleep shades and it totally worked. So, it's, you know, it's a real thing. So Tony had this very simple solution to solving the problem, but why was he able to do it when Dr. Schroeder, an experienced, seasoned, professional, couldn't figure it out? And it was this fundamental difference. Tony didn't assume if the thing were possible. He assumed it were possible. It was simply how. And you can, you in this room, I mean, that is the thing I just believe in so much. The tools, the techniques, the workflow solutions. We do work and process control, synchronization, all the tools and tactics we use, those are easy. But the ability to believe is something you can't teach people. Not to assume the thing can't be done. It can be done, it's just simply how. And the how is the ability to be humble and curious and understand it is possible, we just don't know how yet. And with that mindset, I believe government can deliver the results the citizens, the taxpayers deserve. So final thing, I'm gonna do a pitch, next slide. These books all go to the National Federation of the Blind. I make no money off of these, but they're important to me and they summarize kind of our philosophy. Stop decorating the fish and the world, world of fish decorating, they're pretty, the second one's pretty substantive, it's like a workbook. And, you know, connect me on LinkedIn. I post a lot there to stay active. And um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be with a company who has such a vision and a commitment. I know Brian is very sincere about his desire to provide value to um, government and shares a mission that for every dollar we take in government, we should provide measurable value to those that fund us. And with that, I wish you a great rest of your conference and uh, I'm glad you were here and I welcome you to Utah for those who are visiting. Thank you so much.